Welcome to the Family Worship Center podcast. Each week we bring you our message from our Sunday morning services at Family Worship Center in Beaumont. We don't like the valley. I don't like the valley. You don't like the valley. And guess what? God knows we don't like the valley. But in order to get out of bondage and get to the promised land, you've got to go through the wilderness. We hope you find this message encouraging. it comes down to this if we don't have a vision we're just going to do whatever we think whatever we feel and sometimes that gets us into trouble how many of you have ever thought at some point in time hey this is a really good thing and then maybe a month or two later you said you know i really missed it on that one amen a little show of hands so that's why we need something to look at measure things against that's what this word is for that's why it's given so vision is Number one, awareness. And awareness is the ability to see beyond right here, right now. And if we don't have that, then what we do is we live in the moment. And our society is geared that way. It's living for the moment. Go for the gusto. Live for here and now. You only live once. That's one of the big things this, in this day and time for the millennial generation. YOLO. You only live once. If you've seen that written somewhere and you wondered what it was, but we're afraid to ask, that's what it is. You only live once. And I'm telling you, our society, our nation, our world today lacks the vision to see beyond today. I'm telling you, that's one of the biggest things. And it's, you know, if you look at the book of Revelation and all the things that come to pass in the end times, it's part of it. You only live once. No restraint. What does he say? If you don't have a vision, you cast off restraint. If we we live for today and only today, then we're missing out on some huge things. Sometimes we get very myopic. Anybody here got myopia? Somebody define that for me real quick. It's being nearsighted. So now, let me ask it one more time. Anybody here myopic? Wear glasses to correct that. It means we're nearsighted. It means that we don't see things far off real well. And in the scheme of things, we're all suffering from a case of myopia. God's able to, in in one fell swoop of his eye, and I don't understand it all, folks, the more I learn about God and, and I'm in this, it just blows my mind more and more and more. But God, in one fell swoop of his eye, can see all of eternity. He can see when we're born, he can see how we're living now, and he can see our demise on this earth and whether we'll enter into eternity with him. That blows my mind. Can't even fathom it. I try to wrap my brain around it and it just goes to pieces, my brain. And so the thing is, we all suffer from a lack of awareness. We all suffer from myopia from the standpoint of it's hard for us to be so farsighted in comparison to God. But he has the ability to give us that in the Holy Spirit for us to see beyond today, for us to see beyond maybe this week, I mean, we've all got plans. How many of you have your calendar this week? It's full. You got appointments. You got to work. You got to do this. Some of you getting ready to go back to school. Some of you getting ready to go back to jobs. Some of you already in that. And this week's already planned out and been planned out for a long time. But one thing can happen, and it blows our plans all to pieces. One when, when seemingly tiny thing can, can spiral into something that's huge that affects our lives from here on out. So we lack awareness. We, we are very myopic from the standpoint of it's hard for us to see beyond right here, right now. King George III. Anybody tell me who he was? King, king of Great Britain. The British Empire just so happened to be the one that was the king during this nation's beginnings and whenever this little thing called the Declaration of Independence was signed. In his journal on 
July the 4th, 1776, he entered the, the entry into his journal that said, nothing of any significance happened today. Hello. It was sort of myopic, don't you think? Now, they didn't have fax machines during those days, so, you know, when Thomas Jefferson wrote it up, he didn't have the ability to fax it across the ocean and get it there on time. But I'm telling you, you can have, through the Holy Spirit, an insight. Even if you don't know what it is, sometimes we get this, where the Lord's concerned, sometimes we get expectations and sometimes we get expectancy. And there's a huge difference. Sometimes we build up our expectations. We have great expectations, if you've never read that. We have great expectations. God's going to do this, and God's going to do that, and this is the time that He's going to do it, and this is how it's going to happen. Expectancy is, I know God's up to something, because I can feel it in my bones. I don't know how this is all going to work out. I may be in a situation where I can't figure it out. I, my mind is so finite that, that I'm having trouble figuring out how this is going to happen. But I know God's up to something. And that's where we ought to live. Not in the expectations, because sometimes our expectations fall way short of what God has planned, and we stop working at it. Sometimes we settle for crumbs whenever God has a whole great big cake for us. We'll live over here in, the, in that expectancy. I feel God's presence. I know what I'm thinking. I, I know what I'm feeling, but God may have something way, way, way bigger than that. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, amen, all those great things that God has in store for those that love him. So the thing that we've got to do is realize God's, God's not myopic. He is very, very far-sighted. So why would I limit him by saying, this is what it's going to be, this is my outline, and it has to measure up to this, and then there's where I'm going to quit. Verses the limitless, endless, boundless opportunities that God puts before us. So sometimes what we've got to do is stand back and say, I'm very, very small. And God is really, really, really big. And I can't figure it all out, but God's already got it figured out. He knows who I am. He knows when I was going to be born. He knows how I was going to live and that I was going to give my life to him, my heart and my soul. And he's got something bigger that sometimes I can't figure. See, I've shared with you, there have been several, several times in my life when I thought I had it all figured out. And the further I go in this, the less I try to figure it out. Amen? Because I, I miss it every time. The, 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 the example has been given. I can't figure it out. I don't know every turn and twist in this thing. The thing that I know is that he wrote the last chapter in the book and we win. Amen? That's all I've got to do. Sometimes you don't have to know where you're going as long as you know who you're following. Amen? It doesn't matter all the tr little trails in between. The only thing you've got to know and trust in is who you are following. So having a vision is an awareness that, hey, I'm pretty small in the scheme of things. I, I, I can't figure it all out. So the only thing I've got to do is figure out who I'm following. And realize that he's got some plans that would absolutely blow my mind and your mind. And that sometimes he can't show us the, the whole big picture because it would absolutely, it would be like tilt. And we wouldn't, be able to, we wouldn't be able to take it all in. Or we would start trying to make something happen in order to achieve that end result. In other words, we'd mess it up. So sometimes he, is, he, is, he limits our ability to see so that we won't foul up his everlasting plans. Amen? 
So we look at the word and, and Moses, in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Moses. Moses chapter 11 is what I've always referred to as the hall of faith. And it tells us about all the people that by faith did great things for the kingdom. And Moses stands out in that, and, and it says, Moses did not fear the king's anger, talking about Pharaoh. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. How do you keep your eyes on something that's invisible? You had to see it with that right there. It's that awareness that God is there, that God does care about where you're at, about the things that you're going through right now and today. But more than that, he's got something futuristic planned for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to do you good and not evil. Plans to bring you a hope and a future and to bring you an expected end. Why is it expected? Because he already knows what it is. The only thing we got to do, I worked with a guy that used to use this phrase. If we ever went on a road trip, went somewhere, he'd just say, everybody get in, sit down, shut up, and hang on. (laughs) And sometimes where the Lord's concerned, sometimes we we need to stop saying, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord, get in, sit down, shut up, and hang on, because it is going to be a ride, amen? Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. I had great hopes of getting this sermon done today. (laughs) We'll finish it next week if we don't get done today. So Moses endured, not worrying about what this world was going to bring. Because he saw the one who was invisible. He kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. We get way too technology-based in our day and time. We want to see everything, know everything, and hey, I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I'm the world's worst. Somebody will bring up a subject. First thing I do, whip out that phone. Hey, Siri, tell me about... (laughs) Some of you don't have Siri. You've got that other thing that they have. What is it, Chad? Oh, it's Google. It's Android. (laughs) That's a little joke between me and Chad. (laughs) And Bill. Bill's in on that sometimes. They they like that Android thing. So sometimes we get so, I got to figure it out. I got to know. I got to have the answer right now. And sometimes the waiting is part of the process. It's that thing that we have to do. Abraham, it says, realized that he was the sojourner, a foreigner on this earth. And he was looking for a city, but he came to the knowledge that he was looking for a city that wasn't here. It was a city whose builder and maker was God. And I don't know about you, but there are some times on this earth that I began, after my walk with the Lord, that I began to feel like a foreigner. I began to feel like a stranger, a, a, a sojourner, somebody that's just here for a while. And, and I, I don't feel at home here anymore like I used to. Because used to, I felt like I fit in. And anymore, I feel like I'm a stranger here. I, I don't feel like some people feel about this thing. And I realize that I've, I'm homesick for a place that I've never been before. I'm looking for something that will never be found on this earth, that it will only be realized one day whenever he calls me home and I get to say, oh, hallelujah, isn't this grand? And we have to realize that we're strangers here. Because sometimes we look at things and you're, you're looking at people. Sometimes you're saying, how on earth could you think that way? How on earth could you act that way? And it's, it's because there's something that's changed in here. That we're no longer our own. A fellow that I used to know years ago, he was an elder in, in the church up there in Kentucky. And he's gone to be with the Lord now. He told me one time, he said, I think we ought to print green cards for every born-again believer. 
and give them to everybody with their name on it just so that whenever they get out their wallet that they realize they're not at home anymore. And it's not a bad idea. Amen. Somebody comes to the altar and gets saved, just hand them a green card. Welcome to a different world. (laughs) Wouldn't that be good? And the thing that we have to do is realize that it's that awareness. Psalm 107, or excuse me, 103, verse 7. Again, about Moses. It says, the people of Israel got to see what God did. Moses got to know why he did it. And you realize that those children of Israel had that same opportunity, but it tells us in the book of Exodus that whenever he went up on the mountain and he got the words of God, he came back down and the people said, this is scary. There were lightnings and thunderings and the voice of God came that way and they said, we're scared, so don't let us hear it anymore. You hear it and you come and tell us. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? You had the opportunity to hear the voice of the Lord and you said, let somebody else hear it and come and tell me. Maybe I'm different. I would like to be there firsthand. And I'm sure it would have been scary. I'm sure it would have been awe-inspiring to say the least. But we have in the Holy Spirit the opportunity to know why God is doing what he's doing, not just see what he's doing. Part of it's this right here. And yeah, I know sometimes we say, oh, that's heavy reading. And, that, you know, I've tried to read the Bible. Hey, get in there. As I've said umpteen times, you've heard me say, get you a translation that you can understand. Read it through the first time in that. And then if you feel like it, go back and read it in the King James or the New King James or whatever. And that's, that's, I remember years and years and years ago, I, would, I'd, I started reading through the Bible and I'd, I'd get into all this begat, 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 right up here in the book of Genesis. And I'm boy like, whoo. And there are people that read this all the time. Begat, begat, begat. And, you know, it just didn't, didn't click. I got, I went and got a student Bible. Okay, there are some people that I have known that have went and got children's Bibles. Whatever it takes for you to read it with understanding. Jesus said, go and make disciples. We talked about it last week. Go and make disciples and and remind them of everything I've said. uh, To obey all the commands that I've said. Jesus, before he left, he said, I'm going to send you another comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with you always. And he'll bring to your remembrance whatsoever things I've said. It's hard for the Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance whatsoever things Jesus said if it's not in there to begin with. I don't care if it is a children's Bible version. Get it in there. The Holy Spirit will do with it what he needs to. But it's part of that awareness that God is up to something and we need to live with that expectancy, not expectations, but expectancy. God is still on the throne. God is still up to something. God has a plan, and hallelujah, I'm part of that plan. I'm not just a bystander. I don't have to be a spectator. I don't have to be in the stands. I can be out there on the field, and I can be doing something for the kingdom. Amen? And I can know, just like Moses, why God did something instead of just knowing what God did. Amen? So we got, we got to get, get that part of our vision. Get that part of, of what God's doing. Number two. Attitude. And attitude is faith to believe. Romans chapter 4 that says that Abraham, talking about Abraham again, that even when there was no reason to hope, why? Because he was an old man. And God had told him, you're going to have a son, but here he is 90 and then approaching 100 years old. Even when there was no reason to hope, he kept on believing that he would be the father of many nations. You can't have a vision if you don't have faith. Period. 
If you don't have faith to believe that God can do what he says he can do and that he's for you, not against you, then all of a sudden you don't have a vision. There is no way to have a vision without having faith to believe. Jesus said in one instance, according to your faith, be it unto you. Little faith, little vision. Big faith, big vision. But what did he do? He said, if you even have faith as a mustard seed, you can accomplish great things for the kingdom. Little bitty faith can accomplish great things. And so, again, it's, it's about knowing God. About I, I've heard it explained this way one time. You know, there's lots of definitions for faith, but I heard it said this way one time, and it really stuck with me. Faith is knowing what God knows. And God can speak to our heart, and God can tell us things that this is, this is what's going to happen. This is how this is going to end up. But, I mean, as I said earlier, our minds are so finite. Sometimes we're all caught up in the, how is this going to happen? And, what, you, know, what, 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 you know, what have I got to do to make it happen? The thing you've got to do is do what God tells you to do. And sometimes we get all caught up in the fact that I can't see the end result. I can't, I, I, can't, I can't figure this out, God. So, so I know you said to keep on walking, and I, I, but, you know, I'm just going to sit here and figure this out. So if he said keep walking, I just did what, the opposite of what he said. Sometimes instead of doing what he said to do, we plop down. And, well, I'll, I'll wait till I hear another word from the Lord. Oh, really tired. Maybe instead of reading my Bible, I'll just do that. Any of you ever do that? <laughs> like it's going to get in there by osmosis? <laughs> so sometimes... Even though we, we don't understand it. And, and God, it looks like I'm just walking toward a blank wall. What did he do? What did he say? Keep walking. Let me, let me try and figure this out again because that's just a blank wall. Hey, how are y'all? Hey, how are y'all? Roger, how you doing? All right. Well, everybody else has pointed this way. I guess I better. Yes, sir. <laughs> Shining. I'm letting my light shine. <laughs> so what I'm telling you, sometimes we get off track because we're back to the expectancy versus expectation. My expectation was, well, if I'm walking toward this wall, there ought to be something there for me to look at. There ought to be something for me to see. And I can't figure this out. And the thing that you got to do is whenever you are not hearing from God, go back to the last thing he said do. And if he said walk in faith, then we got to walk in faith. Because it very well could be that we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And if we stop and make a camp, you're going to die spiritually, figuratively, if not for real. You got to keep walking. That was the last thing he said. Right before I, I came down into this valley, I came down off the mountaintop. And we all love the mountaintop. Hallelujah, hold down. I mean, we just, woo, got them little. Hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Got goosebumps on your arm. Woo, I feel the presence of God. But there are scratch marks all the way down the backside of this mountain. Some of them are mine. Because we love the mountaintop. Don't want to leave the mountaintop. But have you ever realized that there's a certain level, if you go high enough, you go out west to the tall mountains... There is a point, it's called the tree line. 
Nothing grows above that. Why? Because the air is too rarefied, too thin. Where do you find the biggest trees? In the valley. We grow when we're going through, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't like the valley. I don't like the valley. You don't like the valley. And guess what? God knows we don't like the valley. But in order to get out of bondage and get to the promised land, you've got to go through the wilderness. How long you stay there is dependent on what you do. The children of Israel were leaving bondage, headed for the promised land. God said, I want you to take this track right here. And what happened along the way? Their faith failed. He even let them go in and look at the promised land. Come back and give us a report. And those spies came back and said, it is everything God said it is. They were carrying a cluster of grapes that it took two men to pack. They put it between them on a staff. I've seen some pretty nice vineyards. My dad always grew grapes when we were growing up. And I've never seen a cluster of grapes big enough that it took two people to pack. Truly, it is a land of milk and honey. It is everything God said it was. Well... Joshua and Caleb, then let's go up at once and take it. Oh, but gosh, what we were lacking and telling you is there's giants in the land. Wah! Do you think God is setting you up for failure or success? Then would he put you up against an opponent that you could not defeat? So what happened was, the people listened to the report of the naysayers, the negatives, the bad news people, not the good news people. And what happened was, they went to the, their, the tents of their, their door of their tents and they began to cry. There is no way. There is no way that we're going to be able to take this land. Sometimes we have a little pity party. And as I've said many, many times, it's okay to sit on your pity pot. Just flush it when you get up. Amen? We all have days, we all have moments whenever we are like that. I just can't believe it. This has just been the worst week I've ever had. Flesh it. <laughs> God's got a good plan for you. And the thing that we got to do is keep on walking. They had to spend 40 years out there when it could have been a matter of a few days. Don't camp in the valley of the shadow of death. When he says keep on walking, keep on walking. When he says stop, that you can see the glory of the Lord, then stop. You got to listen. And whatever he last said is what you need to be doing. That's our goal. That's job number one. Listen and do what the last thing he said to your heart was. And so what we've got to do is realize that we, folks, we've got to get a vision. God's got big plans for this church. It is not for failure. It is not for anything but success. And to reach this lost and dying world, we need to, we need to be busier than we ever have. We need, to, we need to, even though sometimes we look at this world and, and there seems to be so many things coming against the church. Not just this church, but the church. So many things that are happening. Right now, one of, the, one of the big things, this is not just this area. This is not this church. This is not only the United States, but around the world. People have stopped attending. Right now, the average Christian who claims to be a regular attender of church 
50% of the time. Used to. If you said, I'm a regular attender in church, you were here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and anything in between. If we had a revival during the summer, you were there every night. It doesn't happen that way anymore. And fact is, one of the things that, that, that right now is, is everybody's dealing with, it's called the halo effect. And they do these surveys, and it's like, what do you do? Do you go to church? Yeah. But of those people, there's half of them that don't attend. Right now, the figures, as far as surveys is, about 40% of the United States attends church anymore. Now, that's not so in the South. Amen. Thank God we live in the South. But as far as overall, 40% of the people say they attend church, and it's really more closer to 20, 25%. It's called the halo effect, because if I say I do, then that makes me better. When you compare the real figures to the surveys, it tells the truth. So what I'm telling you is, more now than ever, we got to get busy. We got to get a vision for our church. We got to get a vision for what God's doing, and we got to say, God, here I am. What do you want me to do? God, here I am. I know I'm living in expectancy, and I know you're up to something. I can't figure it all out. How are we going to reach all those people that don't want to go to church anymore? I was thinking about it this morning, and I said, you know, if you went and told them, if you got the president or somebody in charge to say, you can't go to church anymore, this place would be full. (laughs) Amen. The couple of Sundays after 9-11, the churches were full. But then they forget, they're, you know, gosh, it's so strange that we're just like the people that sometimes we point a finger at. Children of Israel, they, times that get rough. Oh, God, we can, oh, we need you. Okay, things are pretty good. See you later. Amen. I don't want it to have to come to that. So what is our job? We talked about it last week. Our job is to be the good news people. Go out. Spread the good news. Make disciples. Teaching them to observe whatsoever things Jesus commanded. And really and truly, when you look at it in the big scheme of things, that was the last thing he told us. Now, he may speak to us individually, and he may speak to us as an individual church, but overall, church, church universal, what's the last thing you said? Go and make disciples. Spread the good news. So, folks, what we got to do is say, God, here I am. Use me in whatever way. I want to be a part of what you're doing. If you look around, and I talked about it last week, you can't live there. You can't live in the news channel because it is so depressing. But this thing's winding down. We've got nuclear war on the brink. We've got this nation against that nation. We've got disease we've got oh wait a minute it's a uh, matthew chapter 24 isn't it hmm kind of funny isn't it that all this is coming about just like he said it would so this thing's winding down and we got to keep on keeping on amen we got to get a hold of the lord we got to get a hold of his vision for us and and not get sidetracked and not stop midway Thanks for listening to the Family Worship Center podcast. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you each Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. You can find out more about our church by visiting fwcbmt.org.